uh, good morning. Thank you, everyone, uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to, to host this important event to talk about the state of the transatlantic uh, trade relationship, trade and investment, as you will see. And, um, and I would like to, to thank uh, especially uh, to all the speakers and, and, um, and, and mention um, the economic counselor of the U.S. Embassy, Christia Gord, thank you, uh, Jorge Andreu from ETHEX, uh, Robin Kubiak from the European Commission, um, um, Federico Steinberg from uh, Ghana Royal Institute, and, and especially would like to mention two, two, two speakers uh, today. Uh, one of them is um, Joseph Kimmen, um, a good friend of uh, of Spain and of uh, all the network of Amchams in Europe, and especially the Amcham uh, EU. Um, uh, um, Joseph is, um, is um, managing director and head of mar market strategy of Bank of America that has been um, linked to a report with uh, Professor Hamilton from John Hopkins University talking about the, transatlantic, the, the strength of the transatlantic relation for at least 10 years or, or more. Thank you for coming um, from New York or from, well, any part of, of Europe, but originally <laughs> from New York. And I would like to mention as well uh, Irene Lozano, the Secretary of State for uh, Global Spain. Um, and uh, I would like not only to thank uh, her for being here today, but all the um, good work she is doing um, to explain what is Spain and uh, uh, something <coughs> very much appreciated by this institution and for all our members, uh, both those that um, try to increase the visibility of uh, Spain as a um, as a um, destination of uh, uh, foreign direct investment and those of our members that have to um, have um, uh, have to, to, to go to, to road shows to get money for um, for Spanish companies. So thank you very much, Irene, for all your work that is so important in this in this particular moment in history. Thank you very much to all. I will I will uh, give you the floor, um, Secretary, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Jaime, por esas palabras tan, tan generosas. La verdad es que sí estamos trabajando mucho, pero estamos viendo resultados, que es lo que a uno le gusta, así que estamos muy contentos. Bueno, buenos días a todos, señoras y señores. Eh, para mí es un honor participar eh, en esta conferencia organizada por la centenaria Cámara de Comercio de los Estados Unidos en España, que dirige con tanto acierto y brillantez el señor Malet, amigo Jaime. Eh, quiero felicitarle a él, en primer lugar, al señor Malet, por su excelente trabajo a favor tanto de los lazos comerciales entre España y los Estados Unidos, como del comercio transatlántico en general, que es la cuestión que nos ocupa hoy y que está estrechamente relacionada con mi trabajo, con la función que tengo encomendada como Secretaria de Estado de España Global, que es promover la diplomacia pública y la reputación de España en el mundo. Eh, en su informe, el señor Quinlan, que intervendrá a continuación, destaca que la economía transatlántica es en este momento sólida, pero tiene que hacer frente a turbulencias políticas significativas. Dice esto textualmente. Es verdad que esta descripción era buena ya hace seis meses, pero lo es todavía más ahora que las turbulencias se están mostrando en toda su crudeza. A pesar de todo, y antes de referirme a ellas, Creo que es importante subrayar la contundencia de los datos que dan idea de la dimensión de esta eh, relación transatlántica. Un dato. El comercio transatlántico supone 16 millones de puestos de trabajo a ambos lados del Atlántico. Segundo. Supone la mitad del consumo global. Tercero. Supone una valoración, una facturación por valor de 5.500 millones de dólares. Y cuarto y último dato, supone un tercio del PIB mundial en términos de capacidad de compra. Esta es la dimensión de la relación comercial transatlántica que estamos hablando. Esta relevancia se ve todavía con más nitidez si nos fijamos en la dimensión digital. Tres cuartas partes de todo el contenido digital global se produce en nuestros dos continentes. 
al igual que nada menos que la mitad del flujo de datos planetario. La reciente ratificación del protocolo de enmienda del convenio para evitar la doble imposición es sin duda un hito importante que reforzará estos datos tan positivos. Pero si por un lado los datos son espectaculares, por otro no podemos ser en absoluto complacientes en un momento en el que España se ve afectada por las sanciones comerciales más duras que hayamos experimentado en los últimos años. Es innegable que los aranceles aplicados por el caso Airbus están haciendo daño a sectores de la economía europea y en el caso español particularmente al sector agroalimentario que poco o nada tiene que ver con la aeronáutica. No parece justo. Más aún cuando las sanciones llegan después de que se rechazara la oferta de diálogo de la Comisión Europea para evitar una guerra comercial que solo puede beneficiar a terceros. A esto se suma la espada de Damocles de otro posible conflicto comercial sobre las exportaciones de coches y componentes de automoción, uno de los sectores más dinámicos de la economía española. Coincidirán conmigo en que el contexto no es fácil, pero quizá por eso mismo es más importante que nunca abogar por una relación transatlántica fuerte en lo comercial y también en lo político. En efecto, es hora de apelar a la responsabilidad y recordar que el vínculo transatlántico ha traído al continente un periodo de paz y prosperidad sin precedentes. El pilar de esta relación transatlántica, su verdadera razón de ser, no es otro que el profundo apego de nuestras sociedades a los valores que compartimos, el Estado de Derecho, la democracia y la defensa de los derechos humanos. Juntos, la Unión Europea y Estados Unidos han sido capaces de trasladar esta visión del mundo a las grandes instituciones internacionales y ganar para esa visión a otros muchos grandes actores, aliados. Japón, Canadá, Australia, Suiza, México, Brasil, Argentina. Esa constatación fue la, de, la que determinó la reactivación en plena crisis financiera del G20 como mecanismo privilegiado de concertación. En el mismo sentido, sigue siendo la mejor vía para afrontar Desafíos tan actuales como la regulación de la economía digital o el lanzamiento de la tecnología 5G. Creo que en los momentos difíciles siempre la pregunta crucial que hay que hacerse es ¿qué es lo que está en juego? Y cuando miramos a este momento complicado y nos preguntamos ¿qué es lo que está en juego? Vemos con claridad que no es solo la seguridad y la prosperidad del espacio euroatlántico, sino también la pervivencia del actual orden internacional, basado, y esto es lo más importante, basado en reglas y valores. Es precisamente este marco el que la Unión Europea y dentro de ella España quiere preservar de, a toda costa. Lo cual no quiere decir que seamos ingenuos y que no entendamos que la Unión debe ser capaz de responder frente a actores externos que no se rigen por las mismas reglas, algo que implicará por tanto, exigir una absoluta simetría entre el tratamiento que reciben las inversiones europeas en otros mercados y el que reciben las foráneas en nuestro territorio. El ministro Borrell, en su reciente comparecencia ante el Parlamento Europeo, dijo que esa redefinición de nuestra política exterior, tecnológica, comercial y de inversiones en un contexto de competencia entre potencias es lo que ha movido a la señora von der Leyen a definir al futuro colegio de comisarios como una comisión europea geopolítica. No va a ser sencillo mantener los delicados equilibrios en el seno de la Unión, entre diferentes realidades y aspiraciones, pero estamos convencidos de que es una tarea ineludible y la afrontaremos con determinación. ¿Y qué tiene España que aportar al vínculo transatlántico en un contexto tan complejo? Permítanme recordar algunos datos de nuestra relación bilateral. Tan solo en su dimensión comercial y de inversión, España es el noveno inversor en Estados Unidos y uno de los que más rápidamente crecen en su cifra de stock acumulado de inversión, que se acerca a los 80.000 millones de dólares. Mientras que Estados Unidos es el mayor inversor extranjero en nuestro país, con nada menos que un 16% del total de inversión acumulada. Este flujo de inversiones permite el empleo directo de más de 180.000 personas en España y más de 100.000 en Estados Unidos. Nuestro comercio bilateral crece de modo sostenido y ha alcanzado los 26.000 millones de euros en 2018. Si a ello añadimos muchos otros aspectos, los que se refieren a nuestra cooperación 
en materia de defensa y seguridad, añadimos las cifras de turismo, la investigación científica, la I más D, el intercambio de estudiantes, las intensas relaciones culturales, pues la fotografía que resulta es la de un país pujante con una presencia también creciente en Estados Unidos. Si algo ha caracterizado a la España contemporánea, desde la transición hasta hoy, es nuestra resiliencia. A lo largo de estos 40 años nos hemos enfrentado con retos de enorme magnitud y superarlos nos ha hecho más fuertes, nos ha hecho mejores como país y ha consolidado nuestra democracia. La transformación industrial, el desafío terrorista, la terrible crisis económica de una década y sus secuelas sociales en forma de desigualdad. A todos esos retos nos hemos enfrentado, de todos ellos hemos salido y estamos saliendo más fuertes, más decididos y volcados hacia el futuro y también más conscientes de nuestro papel en el mundo. Es evidente que el momento actual tampoco es sencillo, pero tengan la seguridad de que lo afrontamos con la misma serenidad y determinación y con la misma receta que también nos ha servido a lo largo de todos estos años. Confianza en la democracia, diálogo, respeto del orden constitucional como garante de los derechos y las libertades de todos los ciudadanos. Y sobre todo con nuestro principal activo, que es la sociedad española, una sociedad abierta, tolerante, que vive cada día este estrecho vínculo transatlántico en el que seguimos creyendo y seguiremos fomentando con la misma convicción de siempre. Muchísimas gracias. So, th th thank you very much, um, Josef. Uh, I, I was um, saying thank you to you because uh, I know I know that you are very busy. I I I I think you have been in Brussels, um, um, but you are normally in, in New York. That's right. Mm -hmm. But you are an ex an expert on 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 the on on, on the transatlantic. Uh, um, Relations and, and I would like to 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 be very straightforward in this uh, conversation. Um, first, I would like to you to to give uh, an overview of uh, what have been your findings in the last uh, report uh, that you and Professor mm -hmm. Hamilton have uh, just uh, issued. Well, first, th thank you, and Chan of Spain, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here in this great city, great country. Um, and I want to preface my comments. My comments are my personal comments. They have nothing to do with Bank of America. Um, I will talk about the research I do with Dan Hamilton and Johns Hopkins, but I just kind of I want to lay that out there. These are my opinions. And, you know, they kind of, you know, from my perspective, Dan and I have been doing the survey since 2002, I think, 2003, so quite some time. And every year there's stress and there's strain. There was wars with Cheney and Bush, and the Europeans didn't like that. We had the financial crisis, a lot of angst here in, in Europe and also in, back in the United States. But I think fundamentally the ground is shifting. And you know, we're still seeing the flows, business being done. But politics never before have such, such interfered, not just between the United States and Europe, but obviously the United States and China. So there's a very strong foundation for transatlantic commerce, particularly the United States and Spain, Spain com Spanish companies in the United States. But I don't, I, I don't, it's not business as usual. So companies have to be nimbler, have to think through how they're going to invest the next dollar in the face of tariffs, in the face of China versus the United States and Huawei. When I came into town yesterday, the first sign I saw was Huawei. Wow, I was going to take a picture and send it to the White House, but I didn't want to like upset anyone. But, but that's a big deal. I mean, there's a technology cold war underway between the United States and China. It has ramifications for everyone in this room. So the findings thus far are you know, business is good, it's okay, but there's a lot of uncertainty in and around tariffs, in and around trade, the investment environment. I would, you know, I'll just conclude by saying the United States economy, it's okay, it's growing by 2%, but here in Europe, you're lagging again and again and again. Every year I go to Brussels in March and beg, beg for the European Union to grow, to do something, stimulate, spend, right? Because the president's right, we do have an unbalanced imbalance in trade. Why do we have the imbalance in trade? Because we grow faster than the European Union. So we import more than we export from both sides of the Atlantic. And that is a frustration, not just the president's, but mine. 
because I do see Europe, particularly Germany, doing nothing to drive growth. So there's a lot of cyclical components to the backdrop, structural, political as well. So if you, if you take the, the report that has been uh, uh, issued for at least 10 years, I remember that it was, it was, it was, it was uh, the, the first edition, I don't know if you were there, or only Professor Hamilton, but it was, was just to explain that the importance of uh, the two blocks is based on investment, foreign direct investment, and not only, or not especially, on trade. Mm, and, and this was in a, in a, um, in a, in a terrible moment of uh, the, the relationship between Europe and, and the US during the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. In 10 years, a lot of things have, have happened, or not, not 10 years, 15 years at least. Uh, what, what is the, the, the trend of this important relationship um, in terms of uh, the, uh, political, and economically uh, speaking, what is what is the trend that you have uh, found I, during the years? I mean, I, I'll, I'll speak to economics first and the politics. I mean, the economics, the commerce, the relationship has deepened. You know, more investment from Europe and Spain into the United States across all 50 states over in the United States, in America, and more American investment here in Europe, including Spain. So. We're seeing the flows continue. Do they ebb and flow, right? There's mergers and acquisition. It depends on the crisis and so forth. So there's been a slowdown. Um, so to me, you know, the, the block, the two blocks have gotten bigger, but they're also diverging in terms of interest, political interest. And that's what kind of worries me in the sense that, you know, Donald Trump is transformational. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt. He means what he says, says what he means. He's upset about the trade deficit, so he's out there using tariffs. We saw the WTO ruling around Airbus and Boeing. That's another added element to take into, take into effect. I do believe Europe is stuck in between the United States and China when it battles it out in terms of technology supremacy. You know, are you going to use Huawei system or a Western system? We, we really don't know. It's global supply chains are being th seriously rethought around the world. There's no doubt about it. There's not a CEO. I don't talk to back in the United States. It says we're under review our supply chains in Asia, in Europe, really around the world. So economically, the base is getting bigger just by just doing business, transactions, being deeper into each other's markets, profits. European affiliates in Europe are making pretty good money in the last couple of years. However, here in Europe, U.S. companies have struggled. Some have left town, for instance, left the European Union. Some, like technology companies, feel they're, they're being kind of in the crosshairs related to regulation, pro or con. We can set that aside for a moment. So business continues, but the bigger cloud on the horizon isn't just a cyclical slowdown in demand. It's a political storm that hovers over and continues to rain down. On, on commerce, and that, that in of itself will slow down and inhibit. But I don't, I, I'm, I'm not too pessimistic, pessimistic that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're in part have a divorce, but I am discouraged by the tone of the tariffs. And TPP, I haven't said that, TTIP, I haven't said that in a long time. No, there's one from the, from, the, you know, from the closets, right? Remember TPP, TTIP? We're gonna do TTIP. I used to tell Dan Hamilton, we're not doing TTIP. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but a whole cottage industry went up around TTIP. And it was exciting. It was an opportunity. We learned a lot about each other. And we got into each other's sectors. We understood what you're doing and your values and your, your tariffs and your regulation. So I, I think there was some value there. But the expectation was way too high. And we forget about the common person on the street out here in Madrid or back in the United States that doesn't even know any of this exists. And they want a job, and they want an income, and they want security. And hence, you have populism and a lot of these things that you see going happening around the world. So economically speaking, yes, the base is still there. That's, I think, poised to grow. But politically, everything else is, is really rains down from the politics. And, um, and taking into account that uh, there is a, a clear trade imbalance between uh, the US and many other uh, trading partners, <coughs> especially China with more than 400 uh, something billion uh, per year, uh, something uh, that is, is, is not healthy, taking into account that uh, China is, 
is uh, getting um, a threat for uh, the U.S. hegemony um, uh, in, in today's world. No? But uh, with Europe, uh, we have an uh, imbalance of uh, around 178 billion or something. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 other options could be could be used to uh, mm, uh, to, to to finish with this uh, mm, uh, trade 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 balance uh, trade trade imbalance uh, that mm -hmm. um, uh, make the U.S. accumulate um, uh, um, uh, debt um, uh, during during the years. What 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 other options uh, should uh, the U.S. government explore? to um, re re recover uh, a situation where uh, the U.S. was not a debtor but a creditor mm -hmm. <laughs> in, um, in, in, in historical terms? Well, I think, and this is where AmCham Spain, AmCham in general, they've done a very good job explaining to the media, the politicians, policymakers, that global commerce is beyond trade. It's also investment. So sure. while we're upset, particularly the president, about trade deficit, the, pre the tra president has to be schooled on that it's more than just trade, that there's a lot of U.S. companies making money here in Spain that are not captured by, by the trade statistics. And that's what Dan and I have been trying to do for over a decade, is kind of educate policymakers on how business is actually done. So I think that's kind of number one. Really kind of, there's trade, but th then, which is a small component of the, of the engagement, and then there's investment, which is the bedrock of the relationship. And so it's, it's, it's okay to be focused on the trade deficit up to a point, but recognizing that there's something beneath that. And then beyond that, the European Union, the Commission, it's amazing. We've, how long, we've, we've been talking, we haven't said Brexit yet, which is nice. Um, but, yeah. We'll go to that point. We'll go to I was that hoping point. not to. But, but really, and, you know, Brexit is important, but more important to, more important to me is that, you know, German, or Germany... Europe in general just seems leaderless, right? There's no leader, economic leader, that says, let's, let's have more of Europe. And I just think that that's, to me, I mean, if, if, there's, no, if there's, there's not a better time for Europe to stand up for itself and take its fate in its own hands now. If not now, when, right? And so, you know, Angela Merkel talked about that two years ago, but there, there hasn't been anything really coming out of Germany to stimulate. Brussels, you know, there's still the single market. Remember in 1992, the single market, the directives, particularly in services, they're not done yet. Right? We're still talking about them. You know, this is like decades beyond. So I, I guess the Americans get tired of the talk and no action. Yeah. And they could also say that the Americans, you know, all action, no thought or talk. You know, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> there's some of that as well. So, so if there was more of a, a message or a signal from the European Union, they were serious about the fiscal banking union, Serious about you know finishing the single market, particularly in services, and being serious about the digital market here, and then let companies know what the. Then I think that, you know the actions and the words can come together, and companies can continue to invest. And I always remind investors back in New York, with or without the UK, it doesn't matter. The European Union without the UK is still the second largest economic entity in the world. 500 million people, very wealthy, and China can't hold a candle to the European Union in terms of wealth, opportunity, commercial depth, profits for U.S. companies. I think that's another message we've got to get across. Yeah, that's, that's very important. And um, let's go to tariffs. Um, do you think that the retaliatory um, tariffs are going to increase? We are going to, we are going to, this is the, the end of a process with uh, 301, uh, Section 301, um, imposed um, because of uh, of the uh, Arbas um, um, uh, subsidies, or or do you think that this is going to go um, beyond that, or is it's going to be at the end a negotiation taking into account also that uh, uh, some uh, other um, um, measures can be uh, uh, established by the European Union, uh, taking into account that uh, that we will have uh, an award regarding the subsidies received by Boeing in in in, 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 mm -hmm. in following months. Do you think that this is uh, over? This is going to this is going to this is going to be negotiated, or this is the start of something that is going to to be here for for a while. And that, and uh, this is a question, and the other question is, do you think that this 
great um, um, war is going to affect in any way in investors, mm -hmm. foreign direct investors, that many of uh, the ones that are here in this room? I mean, I, I'll start with the latter. Yeah, I, I do think the tariffs have weighed on the, the CEOs and how they spend their capital, how they reconfigure their global supply chains. We haven't seen a lot of money come back into the United States. Some. You know, we don't have any labor. We're out of workers. We need the European labor force to help drive that. But So we haven't seen any. China's different. We are seeing companies go down in the Southeast Asia, particularly out of Vietnam. Um, in that part of the world, but you know, Vietnam, you know, just put that in perspective, Vietnam, it's, it's, eight, it's 80 million people, it's about the size of one province in China. So you can't move all your production out of China down into Vietnam, it's just not going to happen. Laos, I mean, I think that your economy is smaller than Madrid's probably. So, you know, there's not a lot of places to go, so to speak, and once you're planted, i.e. in Spain, you don't want to pick up and leave because it's very costly in terms of capital, human attention and so forth. But I do believe the tariffs are, are here to stay. And I, that's what kind of worries me. Will the president kind of repeal them as we go forward? We'll see. I don't, maybe we've got an election coming in 2020, of course. The Chinese are pressing for the president, you know, not only not to raise tariffs again in, in say, December, but to repeal the ones that he's put in place. I think, I don't think he's there just yet, you know, in terms of repealing the tariffs against China and or the European Union. But I, I think, you know, he, he's, he's used tariffs as a mechanism, as a way to be transactional, to get people's attention about the trade. And we can argue whether it's the right policy or not, and probably it isn't, but he has certainly got the attention of our trade partners. And the WTO ruling, I mean, that was very clear. That was very clear how the WTO came out and said, you know, there were subsidies that unfair to Boeing because of the Airbus. And here we go. And maybe a different administration would have been, you know, a little bit more, you know, kind of held back, thought about it. But, you know, this administration went, went right for it, which is not surprising. So I think they're here to stay, but I don't think we have to, I don't think they're going to be escalated from here. How we roll them back is a different story. And as you as companies, you've got to offset those costs. You've got to, like, work around, you know, the, the barriers to trade. That's huge. And that costs time and that costs money. So let's go to Brexit. Okay, so two two things. First, um, what do you think what you forecast as uh, the solution for these uh, next uh, two three weeks, or for what is going to happen there? Um, I I think that there are a lot of um, European leaders that um, uh, are are saying to the um, UK uh, colleagues, um, uh, please. Take your time, okay. Take your time. So uh, and, and 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 make this uh, not happening uh, for years. And but but I, I, I am very much interested on, on on your view. And then and then how this can affect um, the the flows of uh, of investment and, and trade between Europe and, and the and, and the US. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, my opinion, my personal opinion. I mean, it's, I just. For the UK to leave the European Union is just economic suicide, yeah. relatively speaking. I mean, it's, you're attached to a big, wealthy entity. I wish it would be more dynamic, but it's still wealthy and it's large. And pulling away, I get it. They didn't like the transfers. Immigration is an issue. But so you're seeing clearly the pain in the UK economy. In the property market, you know, the pound is held, held up a little bit here. The stock market, the FTSE 100. That's holding up only because those European, the, the British companies are more multinational than, say, they're locals. So they, they held up well. Ireland is taking it on the chin because of the, the trade, and I think the, Nor the Northern Ireland border is a big issue. Have we seen any dramatic flows out of the UK to, say, Frankfurt or Madrid, or Dublin, and so forth? To a degree. To a degree. And the, a, lot, a lot of new investment from US companies, or European companies for that matter, in the last two years. If you're going to invest that one dollar in London, maybe you put fifty cents in Paris and fifty cents in Frankfurt as a hedge. So we haven't seen people, companies pick up en masse and, and move out, but they're not reinvesting, and that, that's hugely important in, in that sense. From the U.S. perspective, you know, I have to be honest with you. It, it's just a nut, when you're sitting in New York or Washington or San Francisco, 
when you read about Brexit, and you can't make some of this stuff up in terms of the extension and the other politics, it's just one more reason not to be optimistic about the European Union. It's one more reason to think negatively about the European Union not being a significant player or have the capacity or the capability to get its act together. So I think they kick the can down the road, they get an extension, it's exhausting. It's subtracting from time though, it's, di it's diverting attention from the Brussels, right? I mean, there's so, so many hours in the day you want to spend talking about Brexit and you've got other things to deal with, whether it's immigration and digital economy, you know, you've got the new parliament in session, you don't want to get up and running. They seem to be being, being pulled dragged backwards. But just from a, from a U.S. perspective, top down, um, it, it's just, it's, it's one more reason to be weary about Europe's ability to ever lead and punch above its weight, right? You're, you, it's 500 million people, the wealthiest in the world, 18, 19 trillion dollars economy, and you can't do anything, right? You should be punching above your weight. You know, do something, right? I mean, that, that's the frustration on the part of policymakers and businesses. And this is one more sign. Of. So, so is, is the, the report going to cover UK as a part of the European Union next year or not? I, well, we, 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 we have a special chapter. It's a personal question. It's a it's a personal separate chapter. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've taken the report. By the report, the report's online. The, the last year's report is online at uh, Johns Hopkins, the Center for Transatlantic Relations. But, you know, we, we have to have a little separate chapter on, on the Brexit. Now, the, the, the key question is, you know, how, when the UK leaves the European Union, is it a custom union? Is it a free trade agreement? You know, how, how do they leave, which it seems hard to be doing, but how do they, you know, kind of reestablish? There's going to be trade and investment people flows between the UK and the EU, but under what circumstances? That's yet to be determined in that sense. And there's various options, the Norway option, the Switzerland option. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. So, you know, they're still going to be part of this great economy, but they're just not inside anymore. So we'll see. So yeah, the, the, the report will speak to that specifically. Hopefully by then, I mean, the report doesn't come out until March, uh, we'll have an idea of where we're going. But who knows? <laughs> Let's go to the, to the, to the future. And uh, the first question I would like to ask you is how you see an European Union without the UK Mm, with Germany as as, um, as a major power, without a counterbalance um, power of the um, the Br the British that are uh, sometimes a pain on the neck, but um, <laughs> sometimes uh, needed <laughs> to balance the power the, the power of, of, of Germany in, in, in Europe. Uh, I know. I know that uh, the, the new, the new, the new uh, president of the European um, Commission is is um, is from Germany, uh, and there are a lot of people in in the in, in Europe uh, for historical reasons that do not want uh, uh, Germanize uh, Europe for um, historical and obvious reasons. Uh, do, are you optimistic, uh, Susan Danger, the, the executive director of? Uh, um, and Cham Yu was uh, saying uh, yesterday that uh, she is uh, very optimistic about the European Union, and there is uh, there is uh, 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 there was a, uh, a journalist that was asking me uh, the same question uh, before uh, we started, and um, and I am I am I don't know I don't know if I can be uh, optimistic about about uh, about Europe because I think I think that uh, losing uh, the UK is is going to is going to unbalance um, uh, the power uh, there is going to be a power shift even even bigger to, to, to Germany in Europe and, and this is not going to be for, for Europe and I, I don't know what what do you think about about that well I mean I've thought a lot about that and I think it hinges on you know France trying to step play the role of Britain as a counterbalance to Germany, but it's also it's also Germany wanting to be more European, um, you know, and be part of the bigger club. And, but I'm optimistic. I, I am. I, I'm not being you know kind of. I'm not saying that because I'm in here in Europe. But I tell us a lot to uh, my big hedge fund investors. I mean, they don't realize it was a couple of years ago the European Union was voted to be nominated the Nobel Peace Prize, right, for peace. Why? Because it's worked, it's been hugely successful, relatively speaking, right? The European Union, the whole idea, the concept, <coughs> has been hugely, <coughs> I think, successful. 
<clears throat> Was it perfect? Hardly. Neither is the United States. So I think the European Union has to do a better job telling the average person on the street, you know, what is it like to be a European? You know, you're Spaniard, of course, right? We're all, you know, we're American first, or, um, you know, you're, you're, you, we get that, but we're transatlantic partners. So I think we undersell, here again, undersell the success of the European Union in lifting standards for wage, for countries, for people, for industries, for competition, but there's more work to be done. So the UK is a loss, but I, I, in my opinion, based on my research, and if I have a crystal ball and look in the future, it's the UK that loses while the EU can pull ahead. I'd like to see Brexit as kind of a catalyst, a spark for greater urgency on the part of Brussels, particularly Germany, for more integration, for deeper integration, to, to take care of the loose ends, put the fiscal union in place, more pan-European capital markets, right? More Eurozone members using the Euro. I, that's, that should be a call, right? That should be a catalyst. It should also be a warning shot too, right? That in the sense that you don't want another country going out the door. And I know there's a few small countries that still want to get in. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for the UK, uh, for the EU to function and prosper without the UK, for sure. And, and are you having uh, uh, meetings like this one in, in, in with uh, Ancham um, in, in Germany? No, I've, I've never been invited to Germany. Because I, 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 can, I can give you some <laughs> tips. I can give you some tips. One of them is that uh, ask them to force the government to to spend a little bit a little bit more in um, in, in social programs and infrastructure uh, because it's much needed uh, that Germany recover with. Uh, with um, uh, tax expenditure. Yeah. <laughs> I, expenditure. I, I did have, um, I remember this uh, vividly, like two or three years ago, I had some German Marshall Fund fellows in my office. Half of them were German, and they were from Germany, they were in the United States visiting. And I remember this is the visceral reaction from the Germans when I said, you have to start spending. You're the problem, right? You can't run big current account surpluses. You can't run budget surpluses. And they just looked at me like I was the craziest guy in the world. And they said, they point, said, no, no, you're the problem. You spend too much, you're always in deficits, right? You eat too much. Uh -uh. So it, culturally, it was very interesting, you know, who, who, who thought was the problem, who thought there was a solution. But clearly, I mean, there, there is something to the German model, right? I mean, it, it, it is we should live within our means, right? There's no doubt about that. But it shouldn't become so structural that when there's cyclical weakness, you don't have a lever to pull to help generate growth. I mean, I don't want to be too technical, but they have like you know structural handcuffs on that does not allow them to attack cyclical weakness that they're in. So they're they're in recession right now. They're basically in recession, and they're sitting on a mountain of cash, right now. In the United States, we're going towards recession. We got nothing. We're in a hole of debt. So I'm not sure how that plays out. But we have a very dynamic private sector behind Washington. And don't forget that. That's another, you know, the private sector in the United States. Yeah, I know it's exhausting Washington now with the tweets and the tariffs and the, you know, kind of the war and the wars. But at the end, in, in, at the end of the day, why is the stock market in the United States at or near all-time highs? Because the private sector gets up every day takes on the news and the tweets, and then goes about its business. It creates and destroys, destroys and creates, and wants to do business in Madrid. I mean, it, it's, so don't, don't underestimate that. We've got too many clients, they just be consumed by the cable news, and they, they're paralyzed. Where the rest of the country, good companies, entrepreneurs, private equity, right, they're out there doing stuff. They're out there taking chances and risks. And that's how you folks should operate as well. Yes, it's important. But don't be paralyzed by it. So uh, mm, let's say that, um, and this is my, my final question, uh, let's say that we are 15 years from now, okay? You have been, we are celebrating not 15 years of the Transatlantic Report, but 30 years. Uh, two questions. The first one, what is your view of the role of the European Union in next years, taking into account that uh, we are, uh, or Europeans, or Euro the European Union is a giant for many things, but it's a, it's a, it's a dwarf for many others, uh, especially taking into account that has little influence, um, uh, military and, and, and political, politically in other parts of the world. 
with this uh, kind of cold war between China and the US, what is going to be the role of, of, of Europe <laughs> on that? And second, uh, what do you think you are going to report in your in your in your <laughs> in your study in your study um, in 15 years uh, from now um, in relation to uh, investments and trade? Well, well, one one area Dan and I have to do a better job and start looking at carefully is Euro Asia, right? From China through you know the Kazakhstan, Stans, over the top, you know, the, to Turkey. You know, there's a lot of commerce coming this way, right? Italy signed up for it, so does Greece. I mean, so I think the big challenge, I think, I, I think 10, 15 years from now, we'll, we'll be talking more about, you know, intra-European trade fl investment flows that's incorporating a lot more over from Turkey and the Stans and over, you know, because that infrastructure is being built out. It's coming. It's you know, and China, China is for real. And I think China, China, by the way, is a positive force for global growth. So I think the biggest hurdle that Europe is going to have to straddle, number one, is you know, how do you engage China while still having the, you know, the, the, the deep roots of the transatlantic partnership? There's, you have to straddle. And it can be done successfully. I don't think it has to be either or. And I don't think every administration is going to say, well, you either do business with us or you don't. You do business with us or you don't do business with China. That's what basically what we told Mexico, so to speak, when it comes to the new, when the new trade agreement that hasn't been signed yet. The bigger other, other issue, though, is uh, demographics. Right, demographics. This is an aging population, right? Same in the United States, right? We have, we have countries now where the population is actually declining, right? It's not aging, it's declining. And I'm in country right now speaking to that, right? So when you run that out 10, 15 years, what does that mean for demand, health care costs, budgets, debt that's already been accumulated? What does that mean? And then third, what does that mean? Immigration. I think the country that knows how to assimilate folks who are, you know, we've got 70 million people on the move in this world right now, historic levels, right? Coming out of Africa, coming out of Central Asia, of course the Middle East, Central America, South America. I think the country or region that knows how to assimilate the immigrants <coughs> is the winner because they'll have a younger population, the fertility rate will go back to 2.1, that's where you keep your population stable, and you go on from there. So the question to me would be, does Spain look like Japan 10, 15 years from now? Or does it look more like you know, a, a young, invigorated Spain that leads the way forward? That's gonna be the question. So the big, two, big, the big, the big three things are Euro-Asia, you know, the connection between Europe and China and everything in between, over the top, not on, not on sea. That's number one. Number two, demographics, right? I mean, that, that's hugely important. That's, that, you've got negative interest rates, deflation, lack of demand. Who's going to buy the houses? Who's going to buy? That's a big issue. And then overlay that with immigration. So I hope our report will stretch from, you know, all the way from Spain to Shanghai and, and encompassing this great mass that will include, you know, more of the Middle East, Russia, and so forth. Maybe Dan doesn't agree with me, but that's kind of where I'm thinking. But. I, I take a terrible conclusion about uh, what a um, few things that you have said. No, I don't know if it's terrible, but it's terrible for me. The, the first one is that uh, we have to learn as a, in a short period of time uh, German. The second <laughs> one is uh, that perhaps we should uh, try also with uh, Russian. And definitely, uh, we need uh, a little bit of Chinese, you know. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm Jorge Andreu, uh, Director for Digital Development from Ethex, which is a Spanish TPO, a trade promotion organization. I will be uh, moderating the panel uh, from now until. I think somewhere around 12. Um, uh, the, the issues we will be tackling won't be very different from the ones that have been tackled already in the previous uh, uh, presentations, uh, uh, speeches. Um, but we will try to elaborate a little bit more on those. Uh, I, I have here with me uh, four wonderful panelists that will help me on this purpose. Uh, from your far left to your far right, uh, Christy Agor, um, Economic Counselor from the Embassy of the United States. Uh, Ruben Kubiak, who is a Trade Affairs Officer at the EU uh, Commission. 
um, Joe Quinlan, who is a uh, managing director and chief strategist, uh, chief market strategist at Bank of America Wealth Management, and uh, Federico Steinberg, who is a senior um, advisor at uh, Real Instituto del Cano. And the way we will, we will work in this session is we'll talk about four blocks, four different blocks. So uh, every one of the panelists will uh, dig into every one of these four blocks. The four blocks are, uh, first of all, the EU-US uh, trade relations after the Juncker uh, Trump statement, so pretty much last year. Uh, not talking too much because as a second block about uh, the aircraft disputes. So the first block is Ruben, second block is uh, Federico. Uh, third block will be, uh, we will talk, we will elaborate on China, which is being mentioned before by Joe, uh, by Jaime, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Christy will talk on China, and, and then we will close with WTO, the future of, of WTO. And there Joe uh, will give us a broad perspective, I assume talking about uh, global chains uh, and so on and so forth. So um, every one of the panelists will talk about uh, uh, one, every one of these blocks and then we will have some uh, Q&A among the panelists or they will jump in to elaborate on the topics. So um, I just um, give the floor right away to, to Ruben who will talk about the US trade relations as I said uh, in the aftermath of the statement of Junker Trump almost a year ago. Ruben, whenever you want. Sure. Do you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I, I said I would talk about what happened after the uh, Trump Juncker statement, and I'll do so, but I'll start a bit earlier to make things a bit more understandable why we ended up where we ended. And uh, yesterday on the plane, I thought, well, actually, the real starting point, and I hope you don't mind if I go back a very long time, is actually the Atlantic Conference in 1941, because this is the basis of how Europe and the United States are still trading today, where basically the uh, Allies were sitting together and thinking about the world order after the Second World War, which then became the Brent Wood system, where the general agreement of uh, tariffs and trade uh, was then designed. And uh, under the GATT, basically, the UN and US have been trading since well, forever. Uh, it evolved further and further. There were uh, trade rounds. Um, we uh, reduced tariffs. And in the end, we ended up in 1994 with the WTO. Um, since then, a few things happened that are of quite importance for us. Uh, the first one is uh, basically after the Uruguay round that established the WTO, we uh, saw the Doha round start in 2001, at the same time when China uh, joined the WTO. And maybe not by coincidence, the Doha round led nowhere. So basically the main vehicle to improve trade relations between the European Union and the United States is stuck right now. Um, so uh, since that time then, the, uh, the interest was there to deepen the trade relationship. What followed was a free trade agreement, TTIP, which uh, Mr. Quinn already uh, touched upon. So what we then saw in, uh, I think, 2013, that formally the TTIP negotiation started between the United States and Europe to further deepen the economic relation still. Uh, but in the end, we ended with a, a standstill. Uh, the reason why, when we look now a bit back, uh, there are two reasons. First, I mean tariffs, the main thing what we have worked on so far in trade are already very low. I think the average tariffs are a little bit less than 4% in the US and Europe. Uh, I just looked them up yesterday. Trade-weighted tariffs for non-agricultural products is 1.4% in the European Union and 1.6% in uh, the United States. We do have some tariff peaks, so protectionism on both sides for various reasons, but on average there's almost no tariffs left. So what we mainly focused on was uh, regulatory alignment, getting things together. Well, it didn't work out. That's what we know. The big stumbling blocks, if we look back as well, for the United States, they wanted to have access to the agricultural market of the European Union. The European Union wanted to have more procurement opportunities in the United States. Um, when I talked, when I arrived at my job where I am right now, I talked to the, uh, at that time, chief trade negotiator, Ignacio, uh, who said basically, well, in his view right now is, it should have worked out, it could have worked out, give them a bit more time, and politicians have a more drive, knocking some heads together. So it, it was not natural that these negotiations did not work. Now, nonetheless, in 2016, um, basically they were formally stopped by President Trump, who then came into power together with TPP. Um, so basically we were at a full standstill. 
not much was going on. As I said, WTO stands still, stands still between the EU and the US. Uh, what we saw next is that there were tariffs put on European steel exports and aluminium exports, not only European, but also European exports to the United States. And on the other hand, the rhetoric getting more and more um, aggressive, I would call it. Uh, as has been pointed out, that one of the problems seems to be for the United States that it has a large trade deficit with the world and also claimed with the European Union. I would like to make a point here, often we talk about the trade deficit, we are not talking about the trade deficit, we are talking about the trade and good deficit. We are forgetting about the service sector, we are, we are forgetting about the incomes, investments and so on. If we actually look at that, and I also did it yesterday, this is the latest data for 2018, the United States has a small, I think, 4 billion US dollar surplus. So actually there is no deficit with the European Union. Okay, there is a trade and goods deficit though, but that's a different structure of the economies. And uh, in this situation, uh, finally, President Trump and President Juncker met in July 2018 and discussed the issue and find a way forward to actually do the things we can do together. And uh, they issued a statement where the European Union uh, basically said we were going to try to buy more soybeans, we are going to import more LNG, which actually skyrocketed LNG imports uh, from the United States. And uh, we will discuss the elimination of tariffs uh, on industrial goods. As well, we'll discuss uh, how we can do conformity assessment better. And then finally, in I think beginning of uh, 2019, the uh, Congress passed the negotiation mandate for the US side. In April, it was the European Council that passed our negotiation mandates for the negotiations on the elimination of tariffs and industrial goods and on conformity assessment. Uh, briefly after that, uh, a report or an executive order, I think, uh, was issued by the US President uh, notifying everyone that the European car imports or car imports in general are seen as a national security threat to the United States. This complicated the situation, which we strongly reject because we are strong security partners. Uh, many of our member states are actually allies with the United States, fighting with US troops around the world. So we cannot really see where cars can be a national security threat. We still have the 232 steel and aluminium tariffs, and then in the summer what happened is that, uh, well, the civil aircraft disputes came to first end, where I think later we'll talk a bit more about that, but basically where Airbus and Boeing, or the European Union and the United States both have been found to be sinning under WTO rules to have illegally subsidizing the civil aircraft sector and where the United States since uh, I think last week imposed tariffs uh, of around 6.5 billion uh, US dollars of, US, uh, of European imports. At the same time what we can see is that's not on the European level but where the uh, Trump administration seems to be more willing to use trade policy instruments to drive other issues. We saw the uh, 301 investigation to the French digital service tax where France is the first member state to be targeted but other member states are thinking about the digital service tax, for example Spain, for example Austria, for example the United Kingdom. Um, and. Uh, when we are looking at what's going on on the positive side, uh, we do have the mandates on the uh, negotiations on the elimination of tariffs for industrial goods, but they basically did not work. When we were ready to start, we said, okay, we are ready now, let's start. Basically, the US came to us and said, well, we have agriculture in our negotiation mandates, so we should discuss agriculture. We said, well, President Trump and President Juncker discussed that, and they both ruled it out, so we can't do it. Sorry. That means we haven't even started. We are the European Union, still waiting. We are happy within the agreed uh, mandate. We can do this, but not much is happening. On conformity assessment, uh, quite a bit is happening. Um, but as always, as, as uh, let's say with Brexit, where it said, this is the easiest free trade deal in the world. Yes, in theory it is, but in practice, then you have stumbling blocks. So I do think we will have an agreement on conformity assessment at one point in time. I do believe it is possible to still have it this year. Will we have it still this year? I do not know. But I've talked, I think, about lots of negative things, and I just wanted to end this then because I was thinking about we talk about the politics, and the politics doesn't look too good from the outside often. But actually, the relation between the US and the European Union is very healthy still. We are still the largest investors in each other's economies. We have uh, a, a large um, uh, trade. Uh, relation, I think it was a record 2.2 billion, uh, sorry, tri yep, billion, um, uh, trillion, sorry, 2.2 trillion US dollars. Um, we have uh, almost 5 million workers in the European Union employed by American companies, a bit less in the US by EU companies. So 
When we look at the fundamentals at the supply chains, what's going on, if we go into the details, we see we still have a very healthy relationship. So this, by all the negatives you're hearing, also this is a statement, the relation, the fundamentals are looking still very, very good. I think with that I close. Thank you. Okay. Well, Ruben, thank you very much for, th thanks a lot for your words and, and, and for the explanation of the situation, uh, the trade relationship between the U.S. and the, uh, and, and the EU in this almost not from the start point, but mainly in this last year. I take from your, from your uh, speech that uh, there's a difference between trade deficit and current account deficit, and, uh, and that it should be looked upon. Not only current account deficit, but if you look in, okay, if you, if you want to go down that route, is first of all, the US has a global trade deficit. So has the European Union. Um, but can the US have actually a trade surplus? My opinion is no. I mean, we just had the Tax Cut and Jobs uh, Act, basically where the US is spending money, and it, it is not possible to have a trade surplus. And then if you look at the, with the European Union, also not, because if you, if you combine their trading goods, trading services, and payments, so primary and secondary income, so also what other companies making, and if you then look at that, American companies are much more profitable in the EU than EU companies are in the United States, as a EU official must say, unfortunately. But this is just a fact. So if you look at all that together, we see a small surplus. And if I looked, I think the last 10 or 11 years, we had a very small US surplus, but we had a surplus. So we, we say we have a trade relationship between equals. The European Union has a bit more manufacturing, but the US has a better service sector. So, I mean, you can't compare oranges with apples. But if you look at both, holistically, it's a good relationship. Okay. Uh, so, and then there is, as you, as you mentioned, there is a different productive structure in the countries or in the areas, in the trade areas, that could explain part of it. Um, I don't know if uh, the colleagues in the, in the panel would like to add something to the... Well, I would jump, I mean, I would Please. jump in on something, but, or do you want me to make my 10 minutes afterwards? Uh, uh, well, yeah, if you're yeah. jumping with uh, Airbus, Boeing, exactly. uh, uh, I can introduce the topic, or if you're not... Uh, you're just a the comment issue. there, basically, which is going to link to something that I'm going to say later, but uh, I absolutely agree. Basically, uh, if you look at the trade relationship and <coughs> its imbalances, as a geopolitical problem, as the US seems to be doing with China, then this is a relevant discussion. But between the EU, EU and the US, we are allies, we are trading partners, so actually, if you want to redu reduce the trade deficit, you have to increase domestic savings. That's it, it's basic macroeconomics. So what I'm saying is that using the lenses of geopolitics, as the Trump administration seems to be doing, both with China and with the EU, in my opinion, is not really adequate, at least for the transatlantic. For the Chinese, we can discuss, probably he's right, probably the Europeans disagree on the, you know, the methods to solve the problem, agree with the diagnosis, but that's you know, another reason to get together and talk to China together, also with Japan maybe, with Australia, with South Korea, with Canada, with others. But basically, this bilateral thing, which in the case of the Airbus subsidies is, mm. is making things worse, is, I, I think, not the way to, you know, re reinforce transatlantic relations because we're allies, so if you have a problem with the deficit, you know, increase savings, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I take there is a different angle to, 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 the, whole, to the whole deal, which is uh, including geopolitical uh, issues within an economic sort of problem to be solved somehow. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to, to add anything. If, if not, we can jump on the second block which is something that came out, uh, I think, a few, a few hours or a few days after the meeting was called, after the, the, the workshop was called, which is the ruling on the Airbus uh, Boeing, uh, on the aircraft dispute by WTO. I'm going to quote a couple, uh, I'm going to say, mention a couple of quotes from The Economist uh, article on the issue, which came out a few days after. Uh, the Economist mentioned this was the longest and largest legal dispute WTO ever ruled. On, on subsidies, and as you know, uh, on October 2nd, the United States announced it would raise tariffs up to the tune of, you just mentioned it, 2.5 billion U uh, dollars. Um, and I, I will not dig too much into the thing because it's Federico who's going to talk about the thing, about the issue, but uh, the, these tariffs were uh, raised uh, actually uh, on uh, the 18th. And it affected mainly to uh, uh, aircraft, 10%, and all the products, industrial products, and mainly agri-food, which were mentioned by Secretary 
uh, of state previously in, a, in, a, in, in her speech, those ties will be raised in many of these agri-food products by 25%. So I think it's a, it's a big issue, and uh, I think Federico can, can enlighten, enlighten us uh, on the topic. Thank you very much. Uh, so I want to make three points in these 10 minutes. Uh, looking at the aircraft dispute, but also some wider reflections that derive from there. The first time, the first thing is that this is really unfortunate, I think. Uh, basically, because there were ways to solve the issue uh, with a dialogue, especially knowing that there are more ta possible tariffs authorized by the WTO coming uh, in January, February because of, of Boeing. Uh, selling planes is not the same as selling t-shirts. We both have an interest on preserving at least the you know, duopoly in world markets of Boeing and Airbus, because we know that there are other producers, mainly from China and other emerging markets, that are rapidly gaining uh, market share. And this is about the technological war as well. So, so I don't think it's a good idea that we allies fight each other uh, mm -hmm. on, this, on this area. The second point, uh, and I'll extend a bit now more, is that I think this is going to get worse, unfortunately. And my third point is going to be that Overall, this proves that the world trading you know, context is, is going to be more difficult for promoting uh, the, the bilateral economic relationship, which again is kind of sad in, in this context. So first of all, going directly to, to the case, I know it's, it's well known, but basically uh, you know, there are two main producers, well there used to be uh, two main American producers, you know, McDonnell Douglas was, was no longer important, was merged with Boeing, and then uh, a European consortium, Airbus, was created in the 70s. And, you know, it's one of the few, you know, cooperative <coughs> arrangements in which the Europeans get together and get things done. So, you know, uh, sorry for that, in that sense, but we're proud of it. And I think, you know, the, the, the world, you know, the world demand for air, airplanes is, is, is going to be increasing farther away. So there's space for two companies, probably for some more. but. But you know, this is a, a, an, an economic structure with positive externalities, so, so it makes sense to, to have also some kind of uh, subsidies, at least in the technology, the research and development. You can do it, in the US is done through uh, basically coming from military research, uh, industrial policy, the European case is a bit different. But yes, you know, basically we both uh, infringe some of the WTO regulations. Uh, actually, what's interesting is that it took uh, more than 10 years for a WTO to rule because the evidence that had to be examined was so huge and so complex that basically this proves that it's, it's kind of a special case, right? So basically, yes, the WTO said that you can impose, the US can impose uh, tariffs uh, equivalent to $7.5 billion of European exports. Uh, I was puzzled when I went to the USTR website and this was announced as an award. This is not an award, it's mm -hmm. going to be painful. So basically, it's allowing for something that we all know is going to be bad for everybody, at least if we believe that free trade makes sense. And you know, just the language of calling it an award, or just like uh, President Trump said, this is, was a big win. You know, we understand there's a rhetoric here that the European Commission, for example, is not going to use. But you know, this feels a little bit bad from the European perspective because <coughs> we were expecting that we could solve the, the dispute some, some, somehow in a different way. Then there's the, the problem that, of course, the logic of the WTO retaliation is based on the idea that you can impose tariffs on other sectors so that there's a political economy process within the, the country that is violating the rules that is going to push, you know, for example, uh, European farmers that are going to be hit now to pressure the European Commission to say, look, I'm not guilty of this, uh, change the subsidies, uh, uh, and therefore, you know, th this is logical, this is the way the WTO system operates, and normally it works well. The problem now <coughs> is that since you have the US boycotting <coughs> the WTO appellate system, because it's refusing to accept new judges, and in December it's going to run out of, of judges to, 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 mm -hmm. to rule on, on cases. If now the European Union says, okay, I'm going to eliminate my subsidies, then the US could say, well, just to check it, if you've done it, I want a case, I want another panel, mm -hmm. and it's going to be impossible to form that panel because there are no judges. So in a way, the only option for the EU at this point is to retaliate when we get the new ruling, which is probably going to be 
January, February, we don't know. Mm. Uh, we don't know exactly what is the amount that the WTO is going to authorize for the EU to retaliate because of the Boeing subsidies. Um, probably it's going to be around the same size. And you know, uh, from the US I've been hearing yesterday was there was a statement by Ross saying that we could basically net the tariffs, right? So, but basically we didn't have to go through this process. Uh, and this, I think, undermines a lot the confidence between the two sides, right? The team of Malmstrom with the team of like Iser that have been trying to, you know, find a common ground in this very difficult situation. This makes things worse. And unfortunately, this will be my second point, you know, the, the, the only way forward is probably to assume that the tariffs are going to remain. As you mentioned with China, uh, basically, uh, we know that the EU would not, would never uh, do something outside the WTO uh, rules. Uh, but when, whenever we have the option to retaliate, we will do it. Uh, and the option that, you know, was the, the preference for the European Commission to, was, you know, calm down, wait a couple of months, let's sit down, let's not, not impose tariffs on each other, let's rewrite the rules of the game. And by the way, this could help rewrite the rules of the WTO as a whole, which is something that is deeply needed and is what the EU wants, and I assume what the US also wants. Uh, if we can convince China that the new rules have to be able to tackle some of the problems that the Chinese unfair practices uh, pose to the global trading system, this would have been a better way, right? The problem is that now the, the, you know, the situation gets really uh, contaminated by this uh, discomfort and this lack of trust. And as you mentioned before, if we, got, if we have now more tariffs coming for the car uh, automobile industry, which in my opinion, unfortunately, even though I think the six months that the US administration has to decide end in the 18th of November, probably they will wait a bit more just to receive the new European Commission yeah. with the tariffs, which again is not a very nice way to receive a new you know, team that's going to be ruling, leading <laughs> the EU policies with a geopolitical focus, as uh, the Secretary of State mentioned, for the next five years. Right? So, Unfortunately, uh, you know, this is probably bad news for the transatlantic relationship. Putting this in context, and this is my final point in the wider context, we have to admit that the only trade war that we have in the world at this point is the US-China trade war. So any level of tariff increases because of this, because of uh, retaliation with uh, the case of Boeing, because of automobiles, will never get to the point, fortunately, and I hope, that the US-China uh, tension is, right? We, we know that Chinese uh, tariffs on US products and American tariffs on Chinese products went up from 3% and 8% respectively to around 21 and 23% according to the Peterson Institute figures. And it will, they will go up more in, in after the Christmas uh, if, if the last tariffs actually take effect. Uh, at the European American level, we're talking about you know magnitudes that are much, much smaller. The problem has to do with confidence, right? The latest IMF uh, World Economic Outlook report actually mentioned that the problem with the trade tariffs is not really the effect of the tariffs, but the uncertainty it imposes, the second round effects basically on you know investment decisions, which I agree with you completely, are, are fundamentally more importantly today than, than just the trade. Uh, but also this, this climate of uh, you know discomfort, the idea that the US has lost a lot of soft power capabilities when it comes to the Europeans and I think this is you know deeply disturbing uh, because we would like to have a much better relationship and for that we need more trust and more fundamentally the idea that the Europeans would be really willing to go hand in hand with the Americans to talk to China and form you know a coherent uh, alliance and at this point we, we really feel that it's difficult to do that uh, I'm, I'm speaking from the Spanish perspective, the think tank perspective. Uh, probably the European Commission cannot say these things so directly, but basically we would love the Americans to say, hey, let's share the diagnosis and go to talk to China with other like-minded countries and, and make pressure. And basically China has understood that you know, its economy is slowing down, something has to change. Of course, we cannot ask China, as, as sometimes the Trump administration seems to be willing to do, to completely change its economic model. That's not going to happen. 
uh, but at least we can manage the relationship so that we can live for another 20, 30 years not breaking globalization, not going to a world in which we have two ecosystems, two trading blocks, and then the Europeans in the middle trying to find their way and their role in the world, which again I share with you is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, uh, this, is, this is kind of uh, disappointing from the European perspective, and I really hope that we can at some point get things uh, uh, done in a different way. And I would have a question basically for our American friends, which is, uh, in the event we have a different administration in the US in 2021, do you think the trade relationships we, we, we can change? Because actually, if you look at Elizabeth Warren's or Bernie Sanders' trade policy programs, they're not that different from Trump's. So that's, that's what you make me. Biden's different. You want that one? I don't know who, I don't know who would like to. <laughs> Just a provocation. Why don't you go first? No. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're going back in the United States. Not a Democrat or Republican. Um, there's a feeling, you know, populism is gaining traction, uh, but we're, we've got some moderates. But I think there's enough of discussion out there that, the, the, you know, it's not that the U.S. needs to change, the world needs to change. And, I, 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 and you know, Donald Trump's a formidable competitor in 2020 because he's going to convince a lot of people, right or wrong, that he's winning on the trade front. And so how do, you, how do the Democrats tack around that? So, no, I don't think anything need to change it. That doesn't mean, that means we can't have a thaw, you know, start again. You know, you look at China and the United States, it's gonna be sweet and sour for quite some time. It's gonna ebb and flow, but steady, I think, the, the integration, hopefully, with, between the two big blocks. Chris, would you like to add something? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I agree it's going to ebb and flow. And I have to say, one thing I love about these panels is that we don't let the elephants in the room just sit there quietly. We address them head on. And the tariffs are, a, are, are it's a significant elephant in the room. Um, what I do want to say about that, just to give a little, maybe the point of view you know, from the American side, also from the American worker um, on this case, what the W2 arbiter concluded was that the EU subsidies to Airbus have caused $7.5 billion of harm to the U.S. economy each year since the case began in 2004. So it's not $7.5 billion total, $7.5 billion each year to the U.S. economy and that the harm is ongoing. It has not stopped. The subsidies have not stopped. What this means, in effect, is American manufacturing jobs are being lost as a result. And the WTO system, as you all know, doesn't allow just to write a check and make it go away. Um, what it allows is the imposition of tariffs to rebalance the harm done to the U.S. economy. And you know, to your question about politics and what role that plays, we, we do have to, we have to cut through the sound and the fury and the tweets, as my colleague said, but recognize that this is a process, this is a decision taken through a multilateral process, through the WTO, through the system that Spain is always encouraging us to work through. Um, this investigation began nearly 15 years ago during the George W. Bush administration and has continued through multiple administrations since then. And frankly, that, that was a 15-year period where something could have been done about the subsidies, where negotiations could have taken place. Um, and it wasn't until we got to this point that, that there's a discussion about, well, can we talk to work? Can we take some time? Can we figure it out? Um, the other thing, you know, unfortunately I arrived in Spain right about the time that the tariffs were imposed, um, so some of my first uh, courtesy calls were a little difficult as we discussed these issues, as you can imagine. Um, and one thing that I was asked a lot that I really do understand the question is, is okay, these are subsidies to Airbus, why are the tariffs targeting Spanish olives and olive oil and wine and these products? Um, and just to explain a little about that process, USTR took many things into consideration. Um, including the impact on the U.S. economy uh, and including the desire to induce the EU to end the subsidies to Airbus. Um, there were other industries, uh, in Spain in particular, that were considered um, and that successfully lobbied to not be on the tariff list. Um, but the point of these tariffs you know, isn't to damage the relationship. It's not to get the money back. We never will. But it is to try to make the point that the subsidies are WTO in, in, inconsistent and that it's time for the EU to do something about them. And that's why they were designed the way they were. So, sorry, one last thing is just to say, in not only in the pre-election cycle, but in any political climate, it's very hard for me to imagine a president or presidential candidate saying 7.5 billion each year. Don't, don't worry about it.
Very true. Ruben, yeah, um, as, 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 uh, again, for the European perspective. So thank you very much. And I agree it has been uh, the longest running, I think, WTO dispute. Uh, it has only be also been the costliest. Um, uh, we, uh, our lawyers made an uh, internal estimate, and I'm not reading the figure, but it has been very costly on both sides. So, so far, only the lawyers has won, have won. And what we are saying is um, it needs to come to an end, and we agree, as 15 years, we arrived at a point where finally uh, the WTO ruled the US and the uh, EU have both sent, as uh, has been said before. Yes, there's a so-called launch aid, which are subsidies to Airbus. There are the Washington State tax, which is a subsidy to Boeing. Uh, the assessment is, so far internally, it has been equally damaged. So when you talk about the 7.5 billion, you're correct. But we say the same has happened to Boeing, so we are equally the same, and we have a dual pulley, so no one has really been hurt so far. Now, what happened is in the summer that uh, our new director general who came in said, Finally enough, after seeing also the internal estimate of what the lawyer bills have been so far, um, we need to settle this. So there has been an offer sent to the United States in July 2018, uh, sorry, 2019, um, to, to, to start a discussion. Uh, we have not started yet negotiating a settlement. As I said, the uh, US tariffs come into place. As has been said before, we are awaiting the decision of the arbitrator around January, February. We don't know when exactly the WTO will give us the, the rights. We are expecting the same rights, roughly, the same size as the US, as, as our assessment is. The, the sinning is equal, different methods, but equal. Um, and if the US tariffs are in place, obviously the European Union must place tariffs there as well. There's the political, uh, the political force behind it that we cannot do otherwise, so our hands are bound. So if the US tariffs are still in place, we will need to do the same. I mean, we cannot go to Parliament and say, well, we got the, uh, the world award, we can do. The US has tariffs in place, we can't do. I mean, it, it, it will happen. So, but the only one who will win from this is lawyers. That's what we are saying. It's, it's needless, it's, it's not good, let's settle. And especially what has been said before, what we can see is the Chinese are already building a new airplane heavily subsidized. So what we're actually trying to do is let's not only settle the issue here, let's really look into the civil aircraft sector and find a way how we can prohibit subsidies on a global level to make sure that Boeing and Airbus not only now have, uh, have uh, trading on equal terms, but also that the Chinese cannot come in with their highly subsidized airplane and take market share, which they should do, but on a level playing field only. So we will see how this plays out. What I can say is in general relations is, um, and maybe you've seen that the press where Ambassador Sondland, Sondland to the European Union, said he hopes for restart with the new commission. The new commission is not there yet, but I do know that uh, these sounds have not, or these, these words have not gone unheard. How this will play out, let's see. But we are hoping for a more positive, more forward-looking relation in the future, obviously, and also to settle this issue, which we treat separately. Yeah? This is like a WTO dispute, and by the way, the tariffs, they, they sound a lot and so on, but bring it into perspective, it's between 1% and 2% of EU-US trade. So, I mean, it's, it's a dispute. It's not like a trade war. It's not like US-China, what's going on right there. So we, we, we need to keep the perspective. Yeah, I want to kind of give you an idea of the future market. What percent of the world's never flown on an airplane? You want to take a guess? What percent of the world's never been on an airplane? 80%. So think of the future market. This, this is a very important issue, bilateral. Can I add one last thing? Uh, sure. Sorry, this is only because my colleagues at the, the U.S. Trade Representative would not forgive me if I didn't mention this. Um, but it is their assessment and their point of view in ours as the US government that there is no equivalency between the Boeing case and the Airbus case. And we will see, I know we, I know we have different calculations on this, but for context, the Boeing, the pending WTO case against Boeing is now regarding a tax in sim just Washington state, not federal, Washington state tax from the period of 2013 to 2015 that reduced taxes, again, in Washington state only by 0.19%, so for a two-year period. And that we're putting that up against four EU member states providing billions of dollars of subsidized financing to enable the launch of Airbus's biggest aircraft. We will wait, we will see what happens, but I'm just not convinced that the two are going to be equivalent. I do share the hope that the negotiations can go forward. May I just make a point there? I think this is not what matters. What matters is trying exactly. to continue with a good relationship, because one can come up and say, why do you care so much about the technicalities if you're not going to allow any WTO ruling ever because the, the, the appellate body is being blocked because the U.S. doesn't want it to work? So and if we're friends, this makes no sense. So I think there was, um, I had marked, I had marked uh, something I wanted to quote from that article from The Economist. Uh, 
the article said, uh, it, and I'm quoting, uh, the EU and the US might have been talking past each other along all these years. So uh, maybe there are some incentives to keep talking, and, and, and although I don't see great optimism necessarily in all of the panelists uh, regarding this issue, even if there are amendments to be ruled still by WTO, and there's still another case on the WTO to be ruled, and, and there might be some incentives, but looks like a complex, a very complex issue. The truth is that uh, this ruling, uh, the new tariffs, will affect um, aircraft and industrial and agro products in the EU and specifically in Spain. I just want to mention, since I work at a T TPO at Ethex, that uh, there will be a certain effect in exports on tra and trade on uh, olive oil, wine, citrix, uh, frozen pork, Mantego, which was actually quoted in that article, uh, uh, which along with Parmesan, and Scotch whisky, and I mean, but in Spain, there will be um, certainly a, a big effect. And we're already working on some policies that would help promote uh, alternatives so that the, 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 the companies that are already in the market can find their way out in the market, trying to boost and to promote uh, high added value products in the United States, but also promote activities in other markets with which we have signed recently trade agreements, such as Korea or Japan or, or Canada, and, uh, and try to boost cooperation with other administrations and other partners so that uh, the companies can, can look at this issue on the best possible way, um, e-markets, China, etc. Well, maybe we can go on if there are no more comments uh, to the third block of the conversation, which is China. Uh, Christy mentioned in her previous speech, she talked about the elephant in the room. I think someone else from the panel also mentioned there were many elephants in the room and, and China should be tackled. Well, Christy, the floor is yours to talk on the, uh, on the issue. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to start by echoing what you've heard from my other colleagues from the State Secretary for Global Spain about just how strong the transatlantic business ties are. According to our figures, U.S. goods and services trade with the EU totaled nearly 1.3 trillion in 2018. The EU countries taken together are, would rank first as the export market for the United States, the largest export market, and would rank as the second largest supplier of imports to the U.S. There are impressive trade figures on the U.S.-Spain bilateral trade relationship as well. Uh, trade between our two countries is about 40 billion euros each year and is still increasing. The U.S., uh, also as the Secretary of State for Global Spain mentioned, is the largest source of foreign investment in Spain, more than 64 billion euros, and Spain is the 10th largest foreign investor in the United States, with more than 76 billion in FDI stock as of last year. So what these numbers clearly show is that transatlantic business, and U.S.-Spain business, is good business. And these ties are the result not only of your work, but the work of individual companies making prudent decisions, but it's also the result of a shared value system. A system that puts the rule of law, open markets, fair competition, and transparency at the forefront. And it's a system that protects the rights of individual consumers and investors, and it's based on rules. Now, the U.S., EU, and U.S.-Spain trade relationships are mature relationships. As we've talked about, we're going to have disagreements, and there will be irritants. But at the end of the day, we agree on the rules of international trade <coughs> and in international investment as well. And we also agree that there is a major player on the international economic scene nowadays that is not playing by the rules. And as we talked about before we get directly to China, one last thing to say about the WTO Airbus case is, again, that this is an example of the multilateral rules-based international system working and the U.S. working within that system to redress the harm done to the U.S. economy. It's also an opportunity to show China how the rules work and what compliance with the rules actually looks like. As I mentioned, I've spent a lot of time talking with government officials here in Spain about the tariffs, and one thing I hear and have heard today again is that as the U.S. and EU continue to bicker over tariffs, the only winner will be the lawyers, but also China. And I'm actually more concerned right now that the, what China is learning from this is a lesson in how to avoid compliance. And so I want to zero in on what it is that China is doing and why the U.S. sees China as a strategic threat. China plays by different roles. Um, they have a proactive and state-driven industrial and economic policy, such as the Made in China 2012, 2015, 
that aims to develop companies in, and change them into national champions ready to take over high-tech sectors on a global scale. And how do they do this? By using what we call China's not-so-secret sauce. Um, and the ingredients of that sauce are stolen intellectual property, state subsidies, and a sanctuary market at home. Beijing loves a monopoly. And then when their national champions venture out with distorted financing costs and other state interventions, they're able to undercut EU and US competitors at every turn. So to kind of crystallize what this looks like, I want to talk about three cases uh, that show these tactics, IP theft, state subsidies, and sanctuary market. So first, we'll look at intellectual property and talk about the aerospace industry. So China knew uh, the, stati the statistics that you quoted, um, and that rising per capita GDP is going to spark domestic interest in flying in their huge market. As a result, the Chinese government directed the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China, or COMAC for short, to accelerate construction of uh, the C919, which is a narrow-body twin-jet airliner that would compete primarily with the Boeing 737 MAX and Airbus A320neo. In 2009, COMAC announced it had chosen CFM International, this is a joint venture between GE Aviation and French aerospace firm Safran, to produce a variant of an engine for the C919. At the same time, COMAC and another state-owned Chinese entity called AVIC were apparently tasked with designing their own engine. As it turns out, the Chinese designed engine shared a great many characteristics with the engine from the joint venture. And there's a public indictment by the US Department of Justice that detailed how the new jetliner was built with stolen technology by way of massive hacking operations that were undertaken by the Chinese government that was called Turbine Panda. So it was the sustained cyber espionage efforts undertaken by the Ministry of State Security that knocked several years and potentially billions of dollars off of the development time. So why does this matter? Well, as of last year, COMAC has 1,008 commitments, including 305 firm orders for its jet, for the C919, mostly from Chinese leasing company, companies or airlines. So this demonstrates again that what Beijing is doing is siphoning intellectual property from foreign firms in exchange for providing joint ventures and granting access to China's huge and lucrative market only to later force out the foreign firms as the domestic companies grow competitive with state subsidies, forced technology transfers, and other government support. So next, there's the issue of state subsidies. And for this, I want to look a little bit at China's experience in the solar industry. This is another instance where Beijing's willingness to, uh, and ability to absorb economic losses in order to create national champions that then dominate global markets and destroy competitors elsewhere that are constrained by the usual market economics that most of our companies work within. So Beijing began to so subsidize solar power in 2009. And this is not uncommon uh, for solar, but in China's case, the cash subsidies went overwhelmingly to the upstream producers instead of downstream installers or consumers. So this incentivized an increase in supply capacity without generating a matching domestic demand. As a result, China's share of global solar power capacity increased from 1% in 2009 to 33% of the global market in 2017. And all top eight solar PV producers now are Chinese. China has also been extremely transparent about which industries they plan to focus on next and where they will replicate the pattern. It's all in the China 2030 plan. It's the aerospace industry, artificial intelligence, deep tech, robotics, batteries, e-vehicles, and semiconductors. And finally, there is the issue of the sanctuary market. And the ta one tactic here is China's review of mergers and acquisitions. According to a report by Rhodium Group last year, 30% of all foreign firms involved in mergers with China domiciled firms are called in for government review, but only 6% of mergers involving only Chinese firms ever get reviewed. So much of the recent discourse that we've heard about China, including here in Spain, centers on 5G and Huawei. And with good reason. This is because the transformative power of 5G dramatically compounds the concerns that we have about China's behavior in the economic sphere. The transition from 4G to 5G is a sea change. It's not going to be an incremental move. And security and reliability will become even more important. The global nature of the data flows means that threats to U.S. networks have a direct bearing on the security of our allies, just as threats to our allies' networks are threats to the security of the United States. And Joseph had mentioned that the EU is stuck between U.S. and China on the technology war, but the fact is that the EU shares these concerns, and the United States very much supports the EU's coordinated risk assessment on 5G that was released on October 9 of this year. 
This report stresses the need to protect the availability and integrity of data in the 5G networks because it's these networks that will underpin future critical infrastructure, including healthcare, transportation, water, and electricity supplies. And when when the EU states are considering a 5G vendor or service provider's trustworthiness, they must examine, according to the report, whether there's an independent judiciary, transparency, and a rules-based system in the country where the company is headquartered. So let's look about look at quickly at what China's laws look like in this space. China's national security law, counter espionage law, cybersecurity law, national intelligence law, and other mechanisms provide the Chinese government with broad authorities to compel telecom or other online service providers to cooperate with Chinese intelligence. Under Chinese law, the authorities may conduct security reviews, require local companies to decrypt and share data, hand over source, source code or other sensitive propriety information, and demand that their companies comply with censorship and surveillance requirements. And the key is that these obligations extend outside of China to data held or accessible to firms that are subject, subject to Chinese law, such as Huawei, such as ZTE. And choosing not to comply is not an option for these firms. So Chinese legal tools and their means of coercion apply to both state-owned enterprises and ostensibly private firms. There is no realistic legal recourse to avoid it. So in conclusion, what we want to emphasize, because I, I understand that so much of what you may hear about Huawei, ZTE, and 5G sounds like the Red Scare all over again, but what we have is a powerful economic actor whose economic policy is fundamentally different from the principles and practices from the OECD world in terms of openness and market orientation and the magnitude of state intervention. And these systematic differences have spillover effects beyond China affecting U.S. and EU companies and consumers as well. We talked earlier about the diagnosis and the methods. And the U.S. and the EU agree on the diagnosis. We agree there should be competition, transparency of ownership, and a level playing field. So what do we do? We have different methods, we, but we both have policy instruments that we can adopt and adapt to this new reality. As many of you know, in May of 2019, uh, the U.S. executive order effectively disallowed Chinese vendors from U.S. communication network infrastructure. And the designation of Huawei onto the entities list has already had a measurable effect, including here in Spain, on government, private sector, and individual consumer choices. And there is bipartisan support for these actions in Washington, and the Congress is looking at how to codify the executive law, order into law and make permanent the entities list designation. We're also strengthening our foreign investment review mechanism called FIRMA, which is a revision of CFIUS to include new sectors and make sure we review the ultimate beneficial owner of each transaction. And we're working closely with EU member states and with Spain to increase information sharing and best practices here. In Europe, the new coordinated investment screening mechanism is a promising start. And there are other existing regulatory regimes, such as the general data protection rule, antitrust laws, and trade defense instruments that can be used. A more intense use of EU public procurement directives is another valuable tool. And we do agree that we should work together to reform WTO rules so that China cannot self-certify as a developing economy. We also need to reform WTO rules to address IP, the services sector, and state subsidies issues. The China challenge is clearly one that goes beyond individual countries and individual economies. And we do need to work together with other like-minded market, like market economies, such as Japan, to present a united front. We are not saying that you shouldn't invest in China. That is a huge market. It is a valuable market. But we need to do it with our eyes open and with a clear understanding of the, the strategies of the Chinese companies that are investing here. We also need help from you, from the private sector. We need your stories and we need your experiences. And AmCham can play a role here. It can be very difficult for individual companies to speak out against some of the behaviors that they've seen and suffered at the hands of Chinese competitors, uh, Chinese companies and government actions, because they have the broader interest of doing business in China. And the recent NBA example is, uh, is illustrative of this issue. It's also very difficult to counter Chinese behaviors when their companies are members of many business organizations. And in this vein, AmCham is uniquely positioned to serve as a voice for the issues and concerns of U.S. businesses because you don't represent Chinese companies that I'm aware of. <clears throat> and there is power in numbers. 
We all know that the ingredients of China's not-so-secret sauce are its blueprint for undermining the system that we build together. So working together, we can continue to ensure that free markets, open competition, risk and respect for rule of law and human rights are the values that underpin the next 1.3 trillion in transatlantic trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. I think uh, both Joe had, I want to make a point on technology and geopolitics, but before Federico mentioned that he wanted to, to add something to yes, the uh, conversation. Yes, some comments. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think it's important to mention, you know, emphasize again that I think the EU and, and especially Spain and, and the US share the diagnosis. Our, our concern is with the, the strategy and how to address it. And the problem is that the perception I have is that this is now becoming a world of empires again, which is what the EU always wanted to avoid. Empires and nationalism are the two big enemies of the EU. Well, empires because we Europeans were the empires and we ended up fighting each other because we were the empires, and nationalism because the EU is basically about forgetting nationalism, and the US-China rivalry is about nationalism, right? So the problem is that we are kind of stuck here, uh, but we feel, my, my impression is that most European countries, uh, given the fact that we would love to be the third empire, but maybe we're not ready, or our time passed, but historically, we were empires, you know, Spain 500 years ago, most European uh, nations a hundred years ago, uh, but now we've been used to being on the periphery of the U.S. empire, so to speak, for the last 50, 60 years, and the problem now is that the Chinese empire is coming, and we have to understand that this is coming no matter what we do, and I can understand that for the hegemon, for the U.S., the logical <coughs> strategy is to try to do as much as possible to derail Chinese growth, uh, but this is not going to be successful at the end of the day because it's about numbers and progress and they're just very big. So we would like to have, instead of you know, a world of empires you know, fighting each other and the U.S. trying to decouple from China, because that's actually, in my view, what the U.S. policy is about, uh, you know, to build much more interdependence, particularly in services, so that we understand that decoupling is not an option, right? You talked about how global value chains by companies are being re-established. Re, re and, you know, the European view, I guess, is that, you know, as long as we keep engaged and have, you know, uh, economic interdependence, we're going to avoid the, the, you know, the big threat, which is a military conflict, which is the elephant in the room for the rest of the century, right? This is not going to happen, I hope because of, you know, nuclear deterrence, etc. But still, it would be very useful to try to accept that China is rising and then try to build new rules for this kind of thing. And on that, I think both the EU and the US would have to accept a little bit of a change on the rules that we built it because we were the clear hegemons and everybody else basically had to play by our rules. Uh, and adapt a little bit, and maybe it's worth it to accept a little bit of a, you know, agreed rules on how much uh, public uh, subsidies are acceptable, maybe 10%, 15%, you know, the French have public companies and that's okay, the Koreans have and that's okay. So let's, I, I think it's better to sit and try to, to write common rules before it's too late and we are in a world of two big empires fighting a technological cold war uh, and the Europeans, you know, having to decide if they want to use 5G like Germany decided this week because it's cheap and works, because if your old ally, which is the US, is hitting you anyway with tariffs, then why try to work out that relationship? And that's why I think, I really think we need to get together to, you know, kind of isolate or convince China. I mean, if, I, if, if I could add to that, <clears throat> that's a very good point. China's already here. It's not coming technologically, they're here. Quantum computing, life sciences, lithium batteries, electrical vehicles, they have, as Christy said, stolen a lot of the secret sauce, but they've also done much more when it comes to innovation, basic research and development, educating their labor force, pulling good graduates out of MIT, luring them back home. So to me, the conversation between the United States and Europe is like, you know, not what's going to happen, what just happened, and then go from there. That's a key issue. So, to me, and then another, if you haven't read this, The AI Superpower, I haven't read this book, it's a, it's a very good book about, you know, artificial intelligence. Here again, China has created a state cap, a surveillance system 
that's going to be very important in third countries where the United States and Europe have interests. It's already happening, right? They have surveillance capitalist surveillance capabilities, not capitalism, surveillance capabilities where they can keep track of a minority that they may not want to, you know, have you know, involved. So it's hugely important the technological component between the United States and the EU come together, coalesce. If it doesn't, then as Christy said, China wins, not just the lawyers. If I just may add, and uh, I really appreciate your analysis because it's spot on. We were brought exactly the same. The conclusions we draw from it are sometimes the same, sometimes not, and especially what to do about it. But um, so I, I don't think I agree too much when I say when I write briefings to a hierarchy and so on. Basically, the briefings are EU-US relations, they are WTO, and they are China because it's a triangle that belongs together because this needs to be fixed together. And it, as I said before, it complicates if we have problems in the EU US bilateral relations, it makes it very hard for us to work together on the big problem, and that is the behavior of China, and as I said before, China is not going away, and so on. And um, again, if you, if you go to uh, DC and you talk to, to the think tank, so I think when you look a bit back, um, also contrasting what has been said before about the next administration, so what was actually the game plan when the new USTR came in? So I only heard that from think tanks in Washington DC was, well, we take a China, a long-standing bipartisan problem, China's behavior, we are looking for allies, and we are going to do something about it. And then the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs came and hitting basically every ally of the U uh, United States. Game plan, gone. So the problem is how can we go back to the game plan because this is a game plan the European Union would quite like, right? We need to deal with China. Um, but we need to do it together and not only the US and uh, Europe. Actually, we need to form a coalition and that's in the WTO context, the trilateral, together with Japan. We have uh, Canada, we have Mexico, we have Australia. So of like-minded countries that are large enough to do something because what we can see right now between the US and China is um, actually both sides underestimated each other. The uh, Chinese underestimated how, how hard the US can hit and the US underestimated how much China can endure. And that's where we ended up right now and that's China is not giving in and the US is uh, basically has, has hit as much as it can. Um, so a bit of a dangerous reg regionalization of markets uh, that we can see that supply chains are well between the US and China I don't think they'll, uh, they'll come back up or will be indefinite again so the problem is we need to make sure that this is not going to happen transatlantically that this is not happening to the rest of the world and again now the WTO comes in which is stuck because you can only reform it with China but China obviously doesn't want to reform it and you know all these problems come back and we need to kind of uh, circle the square. We are not sure how yet. The only thing we can say, the restart that, uh, for, for example, Ambassador Sondland has said he's looking forward to. We also hope for that and we really hope we can work much more on China because right now we are not working as much together on China as we should. Um, this really needs to be, needs to be, yeah, strengthened. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we could go on. I know with this with this topic for for a long for quite a long time. Now, so we move on to the last block of the of the conversation, reform WTO, uh, future of trade, uh, from a very macro perspective, not from a, from a micro perspective. And here, Joseph is going to talk about I think uh, global chains of value, and so on and so forth. Joseph, whenever you want. Okay. I mean, from the WTO perspective. I mean, I, this is my opinion. Um, I, I just think it's an, an organization that's in, d dearly in need of a reset, a new mission. Um, I, I think it's terribly ineffective relative to President Trump, China, um, even the European Union. So, I mean, to me, it's in kind of a, a relic of the old war or the previous Cold War. How do we make it more multilateral? That, that's going to be a key challenge. And I do think there's some space here and some opportunity, limited space, however, for the United States and the European Union still to influence China's behavior. It's not over. We can still influence China's behavior. Remember, I, I think the we, kind of my opinion, kind of the Achilles heel of China is what? They've got four, 475 million millennials. These 475 million millennials, they love life. They've grown up leveraging what you and I, the Europeans and the Americans, have created. They have smartphones, they like to travel, not all of them, not all of them, of course, but particularly the women are better, better educated, they see the life outside of China, they see the life here in this great country, 
They come to America, go, go to school, they come to America here, they come to school here in Europe. So there is a wherewithal that the United States and Europe has to influence their behavior. So the, the deal is not done just yet. And we have to kind of work along those paths. So is it WTO with the answer? I don't think so. I, I really don't think so. It's more like power politics. <laughs> it's nationalism. We're living in an era now, <laughs> hardcore nationalism. Hardcore nationalism. And it didn't just start in the United States. It started, it's all over the world and it's spreading. So how do we pick our alliances, our allies, that could be untraditional to make the world different? And maybe, it's the, maybe the United States teams up with China to tell Europe what to do or how to act. Who, who knows? I don't foresee Europe and China coming together to tell U.S. how to act. That's not going to happen. So from a global supply chain, I spend a lot of my times in New York and traveling around the country listening to CEOs, particularly in the industrial side of the equation, the manufacturing side, kind of rue the day that <coughs> Trump, Mr. Trump did come, President Trump did come, shake up the tariff world a little bit here, because we're not sure how much we're doing with Canada, Mexico, right? we got a free trade deal with Japan, South Korea. Of course, they're petrified of the European Union. And I just think how we play this out is going to be very important. And it's, you know, it's remarkable. When the United States slapped tariffs, auto tariffs on China, what company got penalized the most in the United States? was an American company, is BMW, German, right? Because Germany is the largest car exporter, one of the largest in the United States that sells products to China. Airbus, we just had that conversation. I've been down to the plant in Alabama. It's amazing, amazing what they've done for the community, for the workers, for the schools, and the kind of the, kind of the ecosystem they created around that. So like we can, I think, the, the kind of, not to diverge, but like AmCham's, Everyone in this room, we have to kind of educate people on reality, on how the world really works, get our head out of the textbooks, so to speak, and out of the policy clouds, and just drive, how do you, how do you make it real and practical to people how things actually work? Because it's, it's the world, to me, just doesn't make sense anymore when the United States and China go to war, and it's BMW that gets hammered. Or we have a WTO ruling against Airbus in the United States, and Airbus is employing great people in Alabama at great wages. I mean, that, that's, so the world's kind of turned upside down. And I, the only thing I'll say, if, if there's one organization, the WTO, that can't handle the real world, it's the WTO. Mm -hmm. Let me just kind of I mean, emphatically. Unless it's going to be reconstituted, rethought, given a new charter with new members across the board, Africa included, then it's not going to work. And I just think we're wasting you know, kind of valuable time. Federico. Yes, we just published at the Elcano a report on the future of the world trading system and the EU's role. So I invite you to take a look at it. But two, two or three ideas we have there, which are, are, are actually very similar to what you just said. Uh, first is that WTO with 164 countries doesn't work. So, uh, but on the other hand, so it's very difficult to move forward on what we, what we need, which is trade rooms for trading services, e-commerce, uh, you know, the debate on climate change and trade. We're not going to agree with 164 members for this new stuff. On the other hand, now that we have these trade tensions, we are, you know, giving value to something we always thought was not that important. We have, which is to have a lower, low common denominator and a dispute settlement mechanism that at least works for the rules we agreed on. So I, I, would, I would say that we have to go for a minimum reform of the WTO based on you know, some basic, basic, basic understanding, then use the plurilateral approach within the WTO for you know, some countries to, to do agreements, and then accept that this debate we had in the 90s between preferential trade agreements versus multilateral building blocks, stumbling blocks, so, you know, regional trade agreements or preferentials or bilaterals are going to be building blocks for the future kind of the economy we want. And these are very important to maintain the high level of interconnectedness of the global economy. And, you know, the tension at the end of the day we're going to have is that the technology is going to push for more international trade, particularly in services. If you read this uh, Richard Baldwin's latest book, uh, Globotics Upheaval, it's, it's amazing. We, what we can do in new trade, particularly in services, because of the new technologies. On the other hand, if we break the common internet system with, with two empires, if we have more tariffs, if we don't agree on rules, we're going to lose all this potential growth. 
And this is what we have to avoid. And for that, maybe a minimum level of, of reform of WTO is, is the place to start. Totally right. Thank you. Ruben? Yeah, I would, I would start in by, by, by saying, because WTO is not an not a abstract concept, but most people do not realize the importance of the WTO. Uh, let's just imagine the WTO wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here today because most of the companies in this room wouldn't be here. Period. So, uh, therefore we as Europeans are very, very careful to go into the direction, let's break down the WTO and it is not delivering and so on. Well, it has delivered wonderfully. First of all, it has reduced the trade barriers by, by nothing seen in history before. It has worked during the financial crisis, if you compare it to the Great Depression, what happened to the Great Depression, protectionism went up. Uh, what happened in the financial crisis? Well, a few countries, a few protectionist measures went up, but by, by and large, it worked. And the, the, the aim of the WTO, it sounds a bit academic, but it is to protect the negotiated settlement to that countries cannot erect new trade borders, and they didn't. And so we are already living in a very globalized world. So the danger is if we kind of get rid of the WTO to form something new, we'll end up in a non-globalized world. I mean, if this is going to happen, let's say from tomorrow onwards, the WTO will not exist anymore. Who is stopping anyone in the world to set up tariffs of 100%? And you could think, oh, very academic, it will not happen. Well, history tells us it will happen pretty fast. So that's the problem. So we have the WTO, we have the problem that we cannot reform it. It needs to reform, or well, we cannot, certain aspects cannot be reformed right now, as it looks like. But, but what Europe is saying is we need to try to reform, we need to see, we need to see how to handle it, but the problem is we cannot just get rid of the WTO or come with comp something completely new because it's extremely helpful. As I said, it's very underrated because if you ask to jump down the street, the person will not even know that the WTO exists most often, but not sure what it does. But it's like, it's the, as I said, it's the foundation, for example, of the transatlantic trade. Without the WTO, we would have much higher travels between the European Union and America. I'm sure of that. Much, much higher. So it's... But how, how to solve it, no one knows right now. Um, no more comments? Well, well, we, are, we got to the, to the end of the panel. Um, I would just bring up a few remarks that I take with me, although I think there are a lot of open questions as of today uh, remaining out there. Um, I think the, the title of the panel couldn't have been chosen better. Uh, are we at a turning point? Uh, it, it seems like, it seems like. Um, and from, so for the first, from the first block, uh, we talk about the relationship between the U.S. And, and the EU. I take that you know beyond trade deficit, there is current account uh, deficit or surplus, and there are different productive structures that might explain the things that are happening. Uh, from the second block, uh, Airbus, uh, Boeing dispute. I take that there might have been a lot of talking past each other and. I want to be personally optimistic on this. Maybe there is a chance to an incentives to to solve the issue without uh, without hitting uh, uh, exporters and entrepreneurs. In the case of Spain, in the agri food sector. Um, from the third block, China. Well, clearly, uh, geo geopolitics, geo strategy, technology competition is affecting somehow the relationship between the two blocks, the U United States and the EU. And regarding WTO, I think there is a comment that Joseph made, and um, which is, I, I think things are most probably in between WTO will not help, WTO will help. And, and I think uh, there was a comment made by Joseph, very interesting, he, he mentioned WTO might help change somehow the behavior of China. So I take those four uh, things, I assume th there's been so much on the table that probably you have taken there are very many different that it takes from, from the conversation, but this is what I take. I would like to thank the AMCHAM Spain, Jaime, for, for calling all of us to, for the panel, and specifically the panelists, because the topics are very sensitive ones, and uh, it's not extremely easy to talk about them. So thank you, thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you.